Hello everyone and welcome back to my career mode let's play slash tutorial in Kerbal Space Program 1.4.3 and in this episode I'm going to be talking about KOS. KOS is a scripting language for rockets in Kerbal Space Program and it allows you to basically write a program to run your missions. And you might ask why would you want to do that? Well a lot of times it's because you want to keep things consistent for testing purposes. For instance, let's say you were trying to figure out what the optimal launch for a particular rocket would be. Well, if you're going to try and handle the rocket manually, you're going to end up introducing different errors and uh, you know, you're going to be turning a little bit differently here and a little bit differently there. And so it's not going to be consistent and you're not going to get consistent results. Similarly, if you're testing the maximum payload for a rocket, you're going to be doing it a little bit differently each time. So you're going to have variations and you're not going to get a very good test. So I use KOS a lot to uh, test things out, especially launching rockets to see what their maximum payload capacity is. And uh, in this episode, we are just going to be focusing on writing launch scripts. And I'm going to keep it simple. People ask me, well, how do you write KOS launch scripts? And I'll say badly. Basically, I'm not I'm not any sort of specialist in this, and I don't do it particularly well. What I do, what I've done, is sort of a piecemeal sort of uh, way of approaching it, where it's easier to explain, actually, uh, but it's uh, not ideal. So there is an ideal way to write it, but that is not what I have done. Uh, but Fortunately, my way is a little bit easier to explain. Now, when you uh, put KOS into your game data folder, uh, you are going to start the program and it'll give you a message about fonts and you just press OK. And then um, when you load up the save, it'll give you a message about connectivity, which is uh, whether it's going to be you know, communicating properly. Speaking of which, maybe I should put some other antennas here. I just say permit all on that one. To make sure that it always has, uh, it, it, basically, it's asking which a communication system it should use, like remote tech or something else, um, and you just say, well, if the game thinks it's connected, you're connected, and that's good enough. Oops, that's not a good place to put antennae. Um, they're light enough. I'll just put one in the back. Okay. Yeah, that should be enough, hopefully. Okay, so this is just a rescue craft. We've got a rescue contract around Kerbin. Actually, we've got four rescue contracts around Kerbin because we'll probably have to do this more than once. So we're going to be taking out any crew. And here in command and control, we have two parts, scriptable, scriptable control system and this scriptable control system. And I'm not going to use either because in... But typically, for me, I just have it loaded into the command cores. So you can see when I right-click the command core, it's got KOS disk space here. Well, uh, that is that is KOS. That's basically where KOS is sitting. So as long as you have some part with that KOS disk space, you can use KOS with that part. And the way you do that, I'm going to go to Notepad, and the reason... Uh, we've got to be doing a lot in Notepad. Notepad here, we've got the um, add KOS configuration. There's a module magic configuration file. And all you need is this little section here, at part, and this says all parts, basically. This is a wild card. Colon has the module command module uh, and doesn't already have KOS processor. If you have uh, this line needs KOS, so it's indicating that this should only be read if KOS is in game data folder. And it puts little brackets and adds a module called KOS processor with disk space 5000. And so that's what we've got. Basically, then that adds KOS to that command module part. The other sections here add MechJeb. That's the MechJeb one. And uh, this one adds uh, Kerbal Engineer. So that's what that does. But um, hopefully if you've been following along in the videos, you already got this file from me. It was linked in the bottom at some point or another. Uh, otherwise, you could probably find it on the forums and it'll be simple enough. I don't generally want to add the parts because, first of all, they're additional mass, obviously. And second of all, I figured that the, 
the whole point of control cores is that they should ha be able to have the programs inside, right? Right. So with that, let us proceed and we'll talk about how to launch such a thing. So we have it on the launch pad and we have to think about what launch actually involves. And we are going to be thinking about that in Notepad to a large extent. So this is my baseline launch script. This is what uh, I normally modify in order to uh, create new launch scripts for new launchers. And you can see, uh, first of all, it turns SAS off. It clears the screen. Let's just do that. Uh, I think it's fair to say that in our normal launch script, we would want to clear the screen first and then wait five seconds. That's fine. I mean, it gives us time to abort. By the way, I should uh, say that up front. If you have started a launch script and you suddenly decide to abort, the abort uh, uh, key is Control C. So Control C to abort the launch script at that point. We're going to close this. Um, target apoapsis, target periapsis. Well, I think those are important. So what we've got is thing numbers that we are setting up here. And the important thing here is that in KOS, every line ends with a period. So that's how it knows how to stop the line. And you can see these two uh, slash marks. These This indicates a comment that is pretty typical of many different programming languages. So if you see the two little slash marks, it's not going to read this part. None of this is going to be read. Okay, so yeah, uh, target apoapsis, target periapsis, but this is for Earth, obviously. Two uh, 270 kilometers is really high. What we want here is more like, let's say 100. Huh? 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers seems fine. Target inclination, this is again for Earth, and 28.6 is pretty normal for Cape Canaveral, but in this case we just want 0, 0.0. Okay, and here we've got the initial thrust to weight ratio, and for now that's the only one I'm going to add in. Uh, so let's take a look at our rocket. And Mechjeb says on the delta V stats that the sea level thrust weight ratio, which is what we want, is 1.23. So back in Notepad, we'll just say 1.23. And the reason for this is because the higher the initial thrust weight ratio, the shallower we want it to go. The lower the initial thrust weight ratio, the steeper we want it to go. And so that'll come into play later. Okay, now thinking about how a rocket launches, first of all, we're going to stage twice, right? We're going, well, we only need to stage once. Uh, in Realism Overhaul, we would stage twice because we light the engines first and then, then release the clamps. But here we're going to just stage. So at some point, we are going to just say stage, and that will start things. So let's just keep that in mind. But if we if we want things to keep checking on stuff, um, keep updating numbers, it has to be placed in a loop. We're not going to do a loop just yet. Uh, and I'll show you where we're going to start that sort of loop structure, which practically all programs run in. Basically, all programs, they go through a set of checks to see if, like, have you clicked something? Have you pressed a certain key? You know. Uh, and it just goes through that loop constantly. It's constantly checking whether you press G to lower the landing gear, for instance, and it will just go through that many times a second to, and it will just loop through that. But we haven't created the, that kind of loop yet. Okay, so one thing we would want is that throttle should be set to max before launching. So maybe before we stage, what we want is lock uh, sorry, throttle to 1. It goes from 0 to 1, so you're not going to say 100. Lock throttle to 1, we'll set the throttle to 100%. And you can see in this launch script, I do it here. You can see this is, this is a form of a loop. This is the program loop. And it says until mode is set to 0 and we set mode to 2, so it's going to go through this loop until we tell it somewhere at the bottom that the mode is equal to zero, at which point it'll end. Okay, and then we want it to point up would be a really good idea. And the syntax for having it point up 
Well, here I've got it all nestled into a very nice little function, and I'll talk about functions in a little bit. But I'm just going to grab this command, and we're going to parse it out a little bit. Lock steering to heading. Well, this is the pitch, and this is the heading. We're going to just say heading 90 and pitch 90. And here we have a target roll. For now, we're not going to worry about that unless our rocket starts rolling. So this is sufficient for getting us to point up. There are other ways to write point up, but this will be the way that we're going to go for now. Then let's say we hit an altitude where we want it to tilt a little bit. Let's say if um, I'm going to go with the radar altitude, out radar. So this is the radar altitude, the altitude above the ground. Uh, by the time this starts, you might be above water by then. But anyway, um, if out radar is above, let's say, 1,000. Then maybe we should instead lock steering to 80, let's say, 88 degree pitch. And then you can imagine, actually, you know what, I'll just go with ship altitude just to uh, negate the effect of terrain causing a problem. Because if you, it so happens you're over some other terrain, it might go back and forth between different pitches and that'll be really annoying. But you could keep doing this. So let's say at 3000 you want 85 or and then afterwards now, you know, there's a bit of a problem here, hopefully. Hopefully you've caught this, but I'll mention it in a sec. So we, we've done this thing, and this might be a, a seem like a good way of managing the pitch. But first of all, it's going to be sort of jerking between 88 and 85, and then 80. So it'll sort of change very suddenly. It won't be very smooth. Second of all, these are contradictory, right? This condition will occur at the same time as this condition if the altitude is above 4,000. If it's 4,000, this is true and this is true. So it, it won't be able to decide whether to set the pitch to 88 or 85. And this is something that you're going to have to keep in mind when writing any program. You have to make sure that your conditions are exclusive when they're supposed to be exclusive, when this is going to be something that's discrete. You know, it can't do this and this at the same time. You have to make sure that the condition is going to be separate. So we can do that by saying if it's that altitude and, and this is not the best way of writing it, but we're going to change everything anyway. So those who are concerned about this being completely not the way you're supposed to do things, relax. <laughs> relax for a sec here. So ship altitude is greater than 1000 and less than 3000 well now this won't overlap with that and then we could do the same thing here and then we can continue on like this and then we would have a whole lot of different conditionals setting the pitch to different pitches along the way and that would be one way of getting it to take a trajectory but we note that really what we want is as the altitude is going up, it will smoothly change the pitch. Instead of uh, doing it discreetly, you know, this and then it'll suddenly jerk and then turn to 85 degrees and then suddenly jerk and then turn to 80 degrees pitch, we would like it to just turn smoothly. And so this can all be cut down into something a lot sim simpler. And in my regular launch script, that line is here. Now this looks like a horrendous line, but first of all we have a variable called pitch aim. And so what I'm going to do here is instead of having a number here, I'm going to call this pitch aim. And we're going to get rid of this. Okay. And then uh, instead of this conditional, we're going to be setting the pitch aim all the time. And what we want is this is a maximum but what it's going to do is it's going to pick the maximum of two different numbers. And what we've got here is what I'm going to talk about. So set pitch aim to. 
let's say we just did this. Well, first of all, we've got the 90, which is what it starts out at. And then this 90 that it starts out at is being multiplied by a number that takes the radar altitude and divides by some sort of ending altitude. So we're going to have to set that. That's the ending altitude of your uh, gravity turn or pitch program or whatever you want to call it. So if we want to end that turn by, let's say, 70 kilometers because that's space, then that's the number we put here. But usually the gravity turn ends a lot sooner than 70 kilometers. Basically, you're already close to flat by, let's say, 36 kilometers, I think would be good. We'll start with that. Now, remember I told you that it's going to be sensitive to the thrust weight ratio. So instead of having it just be a number like this, maybe what we want is that number divided by this number. So the higher the thrust to weight ratio, the quicker it's going to do the turn. In other words, since this is the ending altitude for the gravity turn, it's going to end the turn lower by dividing the base uh, altitude by the thrust to weight ratio that it started out with. So let's actually make this a little bit higher just to compensate for the fact that when it is divided by 1.23 it's going to end up at about 36,000. So now we have this ending altitude and it's got to take, let's take the ship altitude instead of the radar altitude. Okay, ship altitude divide by that. What sort of number does this give us? Well, at the start, our ship altitude is close to zero. So it's going to be zero divided by some big number, which is close enough to zero. And so this is going to end up being one. 90 times one is 90. And so it'll start close to straight up. By the time we get close to the ending altitude, this will be, let's say, 36,000. And this will be 36,000. 36,000 divided by 36,000 is one. 1 minus 1 is 0, and so this 90 times 0 is going to be 0, and so we'll be perfectly flat. And that's good, right? I mean, basically that means that this is going to give us a thing that's going to smoothly turn through the altitudes from 90 degrees down to flat. And that's all you need. So that, that's the important bit. And what, what else is going on here is, what if I don't want it to stop at zero? What if I want it to stop at like five? I mean, we want to have it have a little bit more pitch just in case uh, we are not making it to space just yet. And so that's this final pitch thing. And so what that does is, let's say we wanted to set a final pitch. Let's just make sure it's still going up a little bit. 5 degrees. Okay. Well, in that case, what we can do is set pitch aim to max final pitch and then make sure to add the extra parentheses over here. Oh, did I miss a parenthesis? Yeah, I had missed parentheses. Let's just add all the parentheses. The nice thing about Notepad++ is that it tells you which parentheses you're closing up. Okay. And so what we've got here is something that says it's going to pick between this number and this number and choose which one is higher. Now, when this is close to 90, which is close to launch, uh, it'll pick this number all the time. But it, once this number gets below 5, it'll just stick to 5. It won't go down to 0 anymore. And so that's what this max function says. Okay, so we can put that sort of thing in, and you can change the final pitch depending on the thrust to weight ratio. In my own launch script, what I did was I set the final pitch, made the final pitch dependent on the second thrust to weight ratio, the second stage thrust to weight ratio. But that's another story. And there's all this other stuff here uh, to further refine the sort of trajectory I wanted, but we don't need to do that just yet. That's sort of more important for realism overhaul stuff. Okay, so we've got a thing here, but there's a problem. Uh, it's just got to check through this once, uh, right? It's, it's not going to check through this continuously. This is not a loop. So let's make a loop. 
And the way I made a loop over here is the way I'm going to make it uh, this time too, because I like this, um, until mode equals zero. So, okay, so we've got until mode equals zero, and this stuff needs to happen sort of right away. So, let's have a if mode equals one. Note that when there's the conditional, you don't put a period here. That's the only exception. You don't put a period outside the brackets. So that's part of the syntax. OK, let's line everything up. So lock throttle to one, stage, lock steering to heading, straight up. That seems fine for mode one. So before we get into the loop, let's set mode to one. So it'll start on that. And then once it's done that, once it's started the launch, wait two seconds, and that's to clear the clamps. Set mode to two. I mean, we don't want it to start turning or anything until it's cleared the clamps. If mode equals two. And then note that it's curly brackets for these conditionals. Oop, I just wanted to cut. Okay, so now we're uh, looping through this and it's going to set the pitch aim like that and then it's got to change the heading every time. How fast do we want to change the heading? It really doesn't matter. I mean, uh, but one of the things that we can do is make sure it doesn't uh, clog things up. And so we're going to have it wait uh, token amount. Uh, you could set it to zero. You could put, probably say zero 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 one, and that just means that it's it's not gonna try and figure out these numbers and jam up the processor some other way. So, I mean that's one one thousandth of a second. So, it's still gotta be checking quickly enough. You don't want it to check so slowly that it's not going to keep up with the physics rate. If uh, the physics rate is set to um, 25 uh, frames per second, then the maximum this should be is 0.04. But okay, so we've got this weight and it's gonna change the pitch until it gets to that ending altitude at which point it's gonna hold it. That's what I'm pretending that this means. So we've missed some parentheses somehow. Okay. Two, two. Okay, yeah, that's what we're hoping that this all means, but we'll check it in practice without a Kerbal in the rocket. But we're missing one very important thing, well, two very important things. First of all, we have to be able to stage. the Somewhere along the way, we're going to have the first stage run out and the second stage is going to start. So what we want is some sort of staging, and it, since our rocket is a straight rocket with no boosters, I'm going to say if ship max thrust is less than one kilonewton, so that's what that says, then if it's ever got that stage, and so, and then wait one second. Okay, we'll see how that works. That's not how I do it in, in the baseline launch script exactly. Uh, there's complications with boosters and stuff like that, but for now we'll we'll go with this. And the other thing we've forgotten is how do we get to mode zero, right? We have to stop this thing at some point. Well, uh, for now, if the ship altitude, uh, no, not the ship altitude. Let's say the ship periapsis, or no, not the periapsis, apoapsis. If the ship's apoapsis is greater than the target periapsis, then for now I'm going to say lock throttle to zero and normally I do a bunch of stuff when it's at the end of the launch script unlock steering, print, launch program concluded, set mode to zero. 
So you can see it's the exact same thing that shuts it down here. But in this case, it hasn't made orbit yet. We'll talk about that after we see what goes wrong here. So this is a little conditional that doesn't need to be outside of mode two. But stuff is likely to go wrong. I'm writing this as I go. Obviously, this is not exactly the same as launch script I normally use. And we're doing this in stock. So I don't entirely know what I'm missing here. I'm trying to write it in a way that makes sense, but doesn't include all of the fiddly details that I've done before. So as you can see, it can be fairly simple. But once we get into practice, uh, once we see how it's working, we'll find out that there are complications and we'll have to adjust for those. But let's just copy. Uh, so select all, control A, control C, and back to Kerbal. Now to run the launch script, we click the KOS and we get the probe core that we want. That's the probe dobodyne at the top. We, um, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to switch to archive. And what this does is it uh, will ensure that all of our rockets have access to the same launch scripts. So otherwise it's just going to be loaded into Discord and forgotten about afterwards. So switch to archive does that. You can also um, go into settings, difficulty options, KOS, and select start on archive all the time. And that will help. So that way you don't have to type this at every time. Okay, and once on archive, I'm going to do edit. Uh, let's just call it launch. Okay, and you'll be able to verify that you're on archive by seeing that archive tag, otherwise it'll have a number. Okay, so let's see what happens when we run this. And I'm liable to have forgotten something, but fortunately we're launching a very cheap rocket. This is still career mode. It's waiting five seconds, launch. There was a roll, so we might want it to not roll. And that's why on my own launch script I had that target roll option uh, added to the added to the line that says lock steering to heading. And you can see it started to turn. And again, it's not doing any fancy calculations. It's just saying oh, that the simple line that uh, divides between our current altitude and the target altitude. Now you can see it's deviating away from the prograde vector. There is a way to stop that, but that can get a little bit complicated. For now, it seems under control. Okay, well, staging worked as well as we could expect it to work, I suppose. And we'll see it, it should hold at 5 degrees, which it does. Now you can see why the final pitch, you might want it to depend on the thrust weight ratio of this stage. Because our time to apoapsis is going down right now. It's not too bad, but it is going down, so... If your upper stage was less powerful than this one, uh, or had less thrust to weight ratio, you might want it to hold a higher final pitch. And eventually what you want is for this to be dynamic too, based on it grabbing a lot more data and thinking about what its velocity is and what its altitude is and how much time to apoapsis it has, and crunch those numbers in a way that allows it to make the decision more dynamically and uh, pitch up or down on its own. But for now, this is okay. Oh, uh-oh. Hmm. It did not lock throttle to zero, did it? It ended the program, though. It said launch program concluded. But uh, we need to make sure that our throttle is down. Another problem is that we're still in the atmosphere, and so it's actually taking its toll on our apoapsis, but since we overburned, it's not too bad in this case. Uh, the next thing we would need is some way of coasting to apoapsis and circularizing, but we also need to compensate for the fact that 
we're obviously not clear of the atmosphere and therefore drag is going to cause problems. So those are things we got to think about, but first we do have a mission to take care of. We want to rescue a Kerbal. So here's our simple rescue path. That's uh, another moon rescue mission. And then there's this Mau Mau's craft. I guess we'll get Mau Mau first, even though that sounds doubly bad. <laughs> uh, Mal being bad in certain languages. Oh, we no longer have communication. I thought this little antenna would be enough, but apparently not. Fortunately, we're high enough that it shouldn't pose too much of a problem. So what we need is something in the script that allows it to, at when we're when our time to apoapsis is low, turn to apoapsis and then burn. Until the periapsis is at the target periapsis and the apoapsis is at the target apoapsis. Okay, well, we are in a position that should allow that craft to catch up to us. We haven't got much of a sending node. Now, having KOS manage a rendezvous is more complicated. But what you've probably noticed about the KOS syntax is that it's sort of user friendly and, you know, the struct, uh, you know, it grabs information in a very straightforward manner like saying ship colon altitude to get the ship's altitude is a nice way of doing it and very easy to understand. So syntax wise, it's uh, accessible. Okay, we have our scientist. Okay, it doesn't look like the train is too bad. So, we have rescued a Kerbal. Okay, but we have the whole matter of circularizing at apoapsis. So, let's take a look at this. So, obviously, our the condition that we want to end up at is not the one where the ship apoapsis is greater than the target periapsis. Uh, if we take a look at this uh, long script, what we've got here is if ship apoapsis is greater than the target apoapsis times a little bit for margin, and the ship periapsis is greater than, I put 160 just to be safe, but that's a complicated thing, um, greater than target periapsis times 0.99, let's say. Give it some margin. Okay, and maybe maybe we should actually reverse that. Makes sense. Uh, no, that would never happen. That that yeah, that would not be good. Forget I said that. That would not be good because we've got the same number for both here. So they're constantly switching off, which is the apoapsis and periapsis. So we have to make sure that this is re uh, Don't worry about it. Um, let, let's just do it this way. So we've got this as the situation we want to end at. And so we're going to have a different situation. If the ship apoapsis is greater than the target periapsis what we want is we still want it to shut down the engine at that point so it can coast but we seem to have an overlap well we might have an overlap between these two so let's put this into a different mode if mode equals 3 Actually, you know what? Let's just say it to nine because that's the last thing that's gonna uh, that's gonna happen anyway. And we might want to add other stuff in the middle here. So this is the last bit. 
Another thing we can do is, right at the start, instead of uh, just having lock throttle to 1, let's first lock throttle to 0. That won't recur. Everything up here happens just once. It's only this stuff that happens over and over and over again. Okay, so let's think about what we're doing if we want to circularize. Once we set the throttle to zero, we want to uh, check the time to apoapsis. And if we take a look at the baseline launch script, so this is a piece of default information, ETA apoapsis. But here I've got a function, time to apoapsis. Well, the reason is because the ETA to apoapsis, if you've passed apoapsis, ends up being some time like 40 minutes, right? Because it suddenly jumps from your time to apoapsis being one second, and then you get to apoapsis, zero seconds, right past apoapsis, it'll suddenly be the time of your orbit. So in order to correct for that, I've got this function that makes sure that if the ETA to apoapsis is greater than the ship orbital period divided by two, it's just going to return a negative number. So instead of giving us a really big number for the ETA to apoapsis, which could cause problems, uh, it's going to return a negative number here because it's subtracting out the orbital period, our orbital period from the ETA to apoapsis. If that doesn't make sense, I, I probably have to draw a picture or show it in Kerbal to really uh, hammer it in. But I'm just going to copy this as a function. And functions go at the bottom here. And the way you call a function is just to say uh, time to AP parentheses. So yeah, there's a period. So, oh, sorry, it's not curly parentheses. It's regular curved parentheses. So it's like this. And what does that do for us? Well, it sets this variable TTA to the corrected time to apoapsis, CTA for time to apoapsis. And the correction is that after we pass apoapsis, it'll start registering negative numbers instead of just some really big number. So that's preferable. And since we've got this TTA, we can say if TTA is greater than 20 seconds, let's say we're going to uh, give ourselves 20 seconds to circularize at apoapsis, uh, set warp to 2. So it's going to time warp a little bit. And then if TTA is less than 20, which includes the negative numbers, which means that it's going to, if for some reason we've passed apoapsis already, which we shouldn't have, but it's going to set warp to zero. And then lock throttle to, oh wait, we, first we want to turn to the right heading. We probably have been tumbling all over the place. Um, so what we want to do is point at 90 degree heading because we're launching from the KSC and we'll be facing 90 degree heading anyway. And pitch zero, right? We want to point directly at the horizon where the prograde vector is likely to be. Let's give it some time to turn there. Um, three seconds. Oh, okay, five seconds. Block. Throttle to one. Okay, now this might be way too much time, this might be not enough time. What we would really like is to replace this with a uh, time that is indicated by our actual thrust weight ratio and how much speed we have. So what we take is orbital speed minus our current speed, then we've got a speed, and then we calculate out how much acceleration we have, and then determine the, the amount of time we need in order to circularize. But that's complicated. So I'll explain that at a separate time. For now, we're going to do this quick and lazy way and see what happens and why we should do it the more precise way. But for now, uh, we'll see how close we get with this. So lock throttle to one. And then what we would like to do is if it's gotten to that point, uh, we should set mode to nine. And then it's going to go down here and check Okay, well, when should I shut down, 
right? And that's when it satisfies these criteria. Well, that might work. It might not work. Let me save this as uh, stock launch. I've already got a stock launch. New or N. Okay. Well, let's do it again. We've got another Kerbal to rescue anyway. Now remember, one thing we haven't compensated for is that drag from the atmosphere. And we'll see what happens with that. Um, actually, you know what? Uh, if there is drag from the atmosphere, then it's possible our ship apoapsis will be less than the target periapsis. Let's just add another um, thingamajig. Conditional. Yeah, uh, no, let's add it out, out here for now. If, let's just copy that. If it's less, I want it to point at the prograde vector. Not prograde, but just point forward. Wait a second. And don't go full throttle because it'll probably overburn. Let's just lock throttle to 0.2, 20%. Now it'll do that as long as the ship apoapsis is less than the target periapsis. And then if it reads that it's more than, it'll lock throttle to zero again and check the time to apoapsis and then do the time warp to apoapsis. Hopefully. Okay, I'm gonna throttle myself down. Oh, I've got a mistake. Oh, sorry, I, I said lock throttle 0.2, but I, I was supposed to say point, uh, 2 point 2.2, so I missed the TO here. And that's another good thing about KOS, it's very good at pointing out where you've made your mistake. much better than a lot of other debugging programs. We still have to fix that roll. Uh-oh. Hmm. Well, that's not what we wanted. So where do we go wrong with that? Well, let's take a look. Ah. Well, if ship apoapsis is less than target periapsis, lock steering to heading, well, that's true right away, isn't it? So right on launch, there was a conflict between this bit and this hastily written bit, and it got stuck on this bit, and it started to turn towards the horizon, and that's a problem. So we can't do it this way. We can't just leave it out here, sitting around. So what we need to do is separate all this out into another mode. If mode equals three. So what we're gonna do is we gotta move that stuff here. And this problematic block also here. Actually, we should have had the entire conditional. And one nice thing about Notepad++ is you can press tab to Tab all of that. Close that, and that's not actually where I wanted to close that. Okay. So that's that one. This one is not necessary. So now it won't interfere with the launch part. And here we're going to say set mode to three. So all it's going to do is once we've reached this, it's going to throw us into here and then it's going to handle this bit or this bit depending on what our altitude is. And that's why we have different modes. So that uh, one part of the launch doesn't interfere with the other part of the launch. In this case, the 
immediate launch part doesn't interfere with the circularization or vice versa. Okay, well, obviously in Kerbal we've lost that rocket, but uh, it was cheap anyway. Let's just go back and build another one. And one reason I'm doing this in this particular way is to show you where the mistakes can be made. Because inevitably, when you're writing programs, you're going to come up with certain very definite ways things can interfere with each other. And so it's good to have a heads up uh, to know what to look out for. Throttle down. And that's because I have a joystick, by the way. That's why I'm always throttling down initially, because it'll pick up the joystick's throttle otherwise. So, uh, copy with Control C, paste. Well, I go Control A to select all this, and then Control V to replace it, and run launch. And this time, no immediate attempt to head to zero. So I think we've at least solved that problem. Okay, staging. And we've got a good ignition on the second stage. Okay, we're getting close to where it has to shut down and do things properly. Let's see if it does. Okay, yeah, it's time warping. Physical time warp, unfortunately, because we're still in the atmosphere. But let's see what happens when the apoapsis gets below 100 kilometers. If it does. Maybe it won't, actually, at our current rate. So we won't be able to check that particular part of the script. But, well, let's see what it does once it gets to close to apoapsis within 20 seconds. Okay, well, we've got another wrinkle. We don't have communication right now, but I think over at our apoapsis we should. We'll see what KOS does. In theory, KOS should obey the communication rules, I think. Oh no, but that's only when loading the program. Once the program is loaded, it should continue on with the program. Okay, it has come out of time, time warp, so yeah. Let's just continue with the program that was previously loaded regardless of the communications, so, which is another fringe benefit of using KOS, by the way. Okay, well, it got us to 108 by 99, and that's close, but, and the reason why it wasn't uh, closer is because we probably did the burn a little bit early, because it really didn't take, like, 15 seconds to do the circularization burn. If we wanted to be more accurate, again, we'd have to do a slightly more complicated calculation. But here we are in orbit, and now we get communication back. And let's just make sure we get the next Kerbal down. So here's our rescue. The next Kerbal is right there. And uh, we're in the higher orbit. Let's go retrograde. So hopefully... This video has made it clear that KOS is rather simple, actually. And it, it shouldn't take too much effort to get into it. The, it's not like writing a super complicated program. In fact, as far as intro to programming is concerned, this is about as good as it gets. In other words, this is a smooth introduction to programming. And you learn a lot about some of the basic problems that can occur with programming without it being too horrible and uh, without having uh, without the bar of learning all sorts of syntax and semantics uh, being too high okay let's make sure we hibernate and warp okay at some point I'm going to need to introduce KAS into this whole thing because it's sort of fun oh we've got rotation okay but we're on board Okay, good enough. Let's get rid of this. We are carrying way too much fuel, but for some reason they put all the rescue contracts in low, low carbon orbit and didn't bother to toss any 
Kerbals in weird orbits, that would be more of a challenge. I was expecting with this rescue vehicle to have more of a challenge, but of the four rescue contracts I picked up, all four of them are in low, low Kerbin orbit with no funny inclination, no, no complications whatsoever, so that's a little bit sad. I was expecting more, and I put uh, more fuel on board as a result. We haven't really talked about inclination either. I put the little inclination line in the launch script, but right now it's only able to go straight out from the KSC, and it wouldn't be able to rendezvous with anything in an inclined orbit around Kerbin. So that's another thing that we need to add to it. And the way we add that to it is, of course, changing the heading. We didn't touch the heading at all. We kept that at 90 the whole way. But, of course, you can just add another variable called target heading, for instance, and change the heading based on the inclination. You can get the inclination information and adjust. But there is also the matter of the launch azimuth, which means the angle you launch at. Right now, we're just launching at 90 to begin with. But it needs to be able to calculate what the correct heading is to launch at to match with a target target inclination. Okay, there you have it. And with this brief intro to KOS, very, very basic intro, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.